Hello, this is Joe Reinhardt, and this demo is from Train Signal. So let's begin with an understanding of the limitations of IP version 4. Keep in mind that IP version 4 has been around for a very long time. It's certainly run its course. It's been able to support the global internet, but it's, there's not been any substantial improvements made to it since 1981. One of the other things that's pretty obvious to anybody that's in networking, and it's certainly documented a lot in various news stories, is one of the limitations of the IP version 4 itself is the address space. There's just simply the exhaustion of the IP version 4 address space, and this is for a variety of factors. It's been partly because of the very explosive growth of the commercial internet, but it's also been because of the proliferation of IP-enabled devices. For instance, Cellular telephones have uh, taken on a very global scope, and they need public addresses when they communicate. And so the limitations of the protocol IP version 4, just the sheer number of devices needing address space, is just simply exhausted because of the number of globally routable IP addresses that have been necessary. Now, in order to address some of these things, there have been various short-term solutions put in place. CIDR, classless interdomain routing. You may remember in our discussions, there was class full addressing and class less addressing. And class full addressing is essentially routing on major network numbers, classes A, B, and C. And that ran its course pretty quickly because you had organizations with huge amounts of class A address space that essentially they weren't using. And, uh, you know, so that kind of broke down the original idea of the address classes. And in fact, classless interdomain routing and classless routing, being able to shrink the size of routing tables, that was one way to address it. Network address translation, or NAT, is another short-term solution for IP version 4 because it goes without saying that not every single device on a network necessarily needs to be able to access the global internet or can access it through a single or a handful of IP addresses. And it, you know, for instance, in most home internet connections, whether they be uh, DSL, cable, wireless internet, and so forth, one routable address can actually support a number of other devices behind the network address translation device. And finally, in concert with NAT, is private addressing. Again, this idea that not every device may need a globally routable IP address. Typically, it's in the 10.0.0 ranges, the 172.16 through 172.31.0.0, or essentially .255.255, 255, and then the 192.168 address space as well, private addressing. Another thing that IP version 6, will, when we talk about that, will improve on IP version 4 is that IP version 4 didn't have inherent security. One of the things that I've said when I typically speak or teach on networking is one of the greatest and most wonderful things about IP version 4 is its openness and its flexibility. And then I go on to say, and one of the most awful things about IP version 4 is its openness and its flexibility. And part of this is security. The original IP version 4 specification didn't have any security mechanisms. In fact, IPsec was added later as a way of being able to address that. And in fact, when it first came out, IPsec, if you would do a simple packet capture, most of the databases would identify it as IP version 6 because IPsec was originally designed to work with IP version 6 and then essentially that piece was transported over to IP version 4 in order to be able to address security needs. Another limitation is scalability. Even with CIDR, a typical BGP routing table is enormous. Now granted, with, as we looked in our BGP lesson, you don't have to take all internet routes into your internet router. You may be able to take a default route or partial routes, but the fact is a full internet routing table is enormous. In fact, I checked the AT&T route server and there were 373,800 prefixes generally slash 24 and above, but that's still an enormous amount of addresses to process. One of the other things about IP version 4 is a lot of government agencies around the world and the U.S. as well have been mandating IP version 6 adoption. Now, it hasn't happened as quickly as everybody would expect, but still, it's being pushed by regulatory agencies. There are actually a number of substantial benefits to the creation of IP version 6. In fact, pictured to the left is a graphic representing the IP version 6 header, just the basic structure. And the first benefit of IP version 6 is the vast address space that's involved. IP version 4 used a 32-bit address space. IP version 6 uses a 128-bit addressing space, substantially larger. In fact, the addressing space is somewhere around the neighborhood of 340 
trillion addresses, certainly enough to be able to provide for multiple devices and all sorts of networking for the foreseeable future. Another benefit of IP version 6 is the address assignment mechanisms. The ability of a device can actually auto configure its own device. It doesn't have to necessarily rely on DHCP to create or give it its addresses. It can calculate it on its own. And in fact, speaking of DHCP, there are a number of advanced DHCP and auto configuration features surrounding and regarding the whole business of address assignment. Another big improvement is global address aggregation. There's a very strict hierarchy involved in IP version 6. In IP version 4, it's supposed to have been globally allocated, but there, it didn't always work out the way that it was supposed to. In IP version 6, it's very strict. So that, for instance, routers in Europe would know what the range of addresses are, for example, in North America, and it would just simply be able to, based on the prefix, be able to send all the traffic there, and it's unlikely then that they'd have to have enormous routing tables in order to be able to do that. So the global address aggregation, the hierarchical structure, is actually very important to IP version 6. One of the other things that IP version 6 does is because of this enormous pool of globally routable addresses, NAT can be eliminated altogether. One of the benefits of, of NAT is being able to conserve addresses, but the negative parts of it is it can break applications, and there are some things that simply don't work correctly. As a result, IP version 6 eliminates it altogether, and routing ends up being a lot more efficient. There isn't this slowdown to be able to go through, for instance, a NAT device in order to be able to take care of things. There is a NAT function in IP version 6, but it's related to IP version 4, IP version 6 coexistence, not in the way we traditionally use NAT with IP version 4. There are also improvements to the IP header. For instance, it's not necessary to do a checksum calculation for every single packet. In IP version 4, that's the way that it's done, and it can slow things down. It's been eliminated in IP version 6. There's also, because of the flow label, you notice in the upper right-hand corner of the diagram that says flow label, there's a way to be able to identify TCP and UDP flows that are part of a single packet stream, and this is part of the efficiency of the IP version 6 header. Another thing is that there are no broadcasts in IP version 6. They have been eliminated altogether. In fact, what functions were broadcast oriented in IP version 4 are all multicast driven in IP version 6. So, no broadcasts. Thanks for watching. For more information regarding our training, please visit www.trainsignal.com.